welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight at our program on flying dinosaurs. Um, this is a visiting professors series, um, which is sponsored by the Friends of the Glencoe Public Library. And um, we're extremely pleased to have Dr. O'Connor with us tonight. We are recording this program. Um, so um, if you have to leave early or if you want to recommend it to somebody, I'll be um, uh, sending everyone who registered for the program a link to the, the final video, and it'll be also be available through the library's YouTube channel, um, which is on our website, and that'll be sometime next week. Um, let me do a poll really fast before we get started, just asking how many people are watching this on your screen. All right. And now um, I want to mention that um, you will probably have some questions because this is Going to be awfully interesting. And um, I I'm asking you to please put your questions into chat or Q&A anytime during the lecture. This is a webinar, so you can't ask the questions yourself, but I'd be happy to ask them for you when um, Dr. O'Connor is finished with her program. Yeah, now let me tell you a little bit about Dr. O'Connor. Before joining the Field Museum in 2020, she spent 10 years working at China's premier paleontology Paleontological Research Center, the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology. A native of Pasadena, California, she has a doctorate in Mesozoic birds from the University of Southern California. Her research explores the repeated evolution and parallel refinement of flight among dinosaurs, the dinosaur bird transition, and the biology of stem avians. Dr. O'Connor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be sharing my research with my uh, with Illinois, which is um, you know I'm very new here, so I'm excited to get to know the different communities that are, are around Chicago and the Field Museum. So. Um, Maybe some of you thought this is going to be a talk about flying dinosaurs and you were imagining these creatures, but actually, uh, although pop culture will commonly group pterosaurs in with dinosaurs, they are in fact not dinosaurs. They are flying reptiles, but not flying dinosaurs. When we're talking about flying dinosaurs, what we're mostly talking about are birds, which are, of course, also living dinosaurs. Now, the purpose of this talk this evening is to tell you a story of scientific discovery about how we came to understand that birds are, in fact, living dinosaurs, uh, that a flight evolved multiple times within dinosaurs, and how important the rare preservation of soft tissues have been to our understanding of this evolutionary story. Now, when I talk about soft tissues, basically we mean everything that is in this picture that is marked black. So it is all the tissue that makes up our body that it, with the exception of biomineralized tissues like bone. So we're talking about muscles, skin, nerve tissues. Now, of course, when most people imagine paleontology and especially vertebrate paleontology, we imagine paleontologists roaming these uh, vast and remote deserts. Uh, this is actually a picture I took while doing field work in Mongolia, so that part is pretty correct. And you're probably imagining, you know, some pale white colored bones um, eroding out of, of the landscape, which yes, again, is pretty accurate and does account for the vast majority of fossils when it comes to vertebrate paleontology. However, soft bodied animals do, and soft tissues do fossilize. For example, if we did not, if soft tissues did not fossilize, we would know nothing about life before the evolution of biomineralized skeletons. For example, the shell that surrounds a gastropod or the shells of a trilobite. So here we have, um, you know, for example, the entire Ediacaran fauna, which predates the Cambrian explosion. It's about 630 to 540 million years old. These, this consists entirely of soft bodied fossils. But of course, I probably don't have to be telling you about this because the state fossil of Illinois is a soft bodied critter, the Tully monster. So the entire fossil that we have of this animal is preserved soft tissue. 
Now here we have a snapshot of the evolving planet uh, dinosaur hall that is at the Field Museum where I work. And of course, you're looking at this and being like, I'm seeing mostly just bones, right? But maybe if you were looking really closely and looking at every little thing that was on display, you may have noticed this specimen here. It's not that impressive, I suppose, to the untrained eye, but what we're looking at is preserved skin impressions covering the tail approximately this portion of a duck-billed dinosaur or a group called the Hadrosauridae. And we can actually, or we, I'm using the royal we, scientists who have studied similar specimens have been able to determine that hadrosaurs were gray based on the preservation of molecules within the preserved soft tissue. Now, deposits that commonly preserve except, like, uh, exceptional fossils, which are, of course, fossils that are either complete and fully articulated. Articulated just means that the bones are all still in their natural positions, as you can see in this bat fossil here. Uh, these types of exceptional fossils commonly occur in deposits that we refer to as Lagerstätten, and this is German meaning storage place. So, um, you know, fun fact, the origin of the study of geology was in Germany. So in geology, we use a lot of German terms that are left over from those days, such as Lagerstätten. And perhaps if you visited the Field Museum, I can't actually say, I was gonna say recently, but I have no idea when this exhibit was first created since I am very new to this position. But uh, if you are in the Evolving Planet Hall and you go past the dinosaurs, the next room you will see is a room dedicated entirely to a single Lagerstätte called the Green River Formation. And these all these fossils that you can see preserved uh, in the slide here are from the Green River. Uh, it's about 52 million years old and it outcrops primarily in Wyoming, but also in some other uh, surrounding areas. And you can see that these fossils are exceptionally preserved, articulated, and also some of them preserve soft tissues in the form of feathers here and here in these birds. Now the Lagerstätten that we're going to be talking about, or rather the Lagerstätten that has produced the fossils that are relevant to the story that I want to tell is much older and also found in a much farther away locality. So I'm going to be talking about mostly about fossils from the Jehol biota uh, or the Jehol Lagerstätten, which is about 131 to 120 million years old and occurs in the Northeastern China. And you can see these fossils are spectacularly well-preserved. Uh, everything from soft tissue things like plants and insects. We have all sorts of reptiles, amphibians, dinosaurs, mammals, reptiles, invertebrates, pterosaurs. And you can see that a lot of these specimens that I've put on this slab preserve soft tissues, such as this dinosaur with proto feathers here or this cute fuzzy little mammal. So this Lagerstatten is characterized by this exceptional preservation, which gives us additional clues that we don't normally get in paleontology, but are really critical for our understanding of extinct animals. Now, what really got everybody excited about the Jehol Lagerstatten, which had actually been known since the mid 19th century, where um, French, uh, French Jesuit priests were actually studying fossil fish that were from this area. However, the, the importance of this Lagerstatten went basically unnoticed until in the late 1990s, a farmer struck gold, if you will, when he discovered the first dinosaur fossil that preserved feathers. This specimen of Sinoceropteryx here, which made the cover of Nature Magazine, which is the number one journal for publishing scientific papers, and ignited this in this huge amount of interest in these deposits that have then produced that enormous fauna that I showed you on the previous slide. Now my primary area of research is fossil birds. So this slide here shows you three specimens of the same species of bird. It's a taxon called Sapiornis. And you're probably thinking, well, this specimen doesn't look very nice. Well, it doesn't. And it was the first specimen of this taxon that was ever found. And then as we found more and more specimens, of course, we started to focus our attention on the specimens that were better and better preserved. So my point is in showing you this slide is to make the argument that exceptional preservation is relative. So this first specimen when published is exceptional 
when you consider what most Mesozoic bird fossils look like. So let me give you an example of two Mesozoic bird holotype specimens, holotype meaning that this is the specimen that we use to name a new species that are from North America. And uh, here you have the holotype of Avisaurus. It's just a single bone. So the rest of the animal, you basically have to make a very educated guess about. And here you have the holotype of a bird called Flexomornis. And you just have basically one bone, the scapula, that's your shoulder blade, and then some you know, half bits of a couple other bones. So compared to Mes Mesozoic bird fossils from outside, uh, from other places in the world, the, you know, even the worst preserved specimen from the Jeho biota is exceptionally well preserved. But you can really see in this slide the variation in preservation in fossils from this area. So you don't always have these beautiful, complete specimens preserving lots of soft tissue. Sometimes you have something like this where it's less complete, disarticulated, no soft tissues, and you have everything in between. It's the spectrum. Let's talk about the idea that birds are living dinosaurs. Now, this is not a new idea. In fact, it was first proposed in 1868 by a man named Thomas Huxley. So uh, in uh, 1857, I believe, or 1859, sorry. In 1859, uh, Charles Darwin first publishes On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. This idea that animals have changed through time by natural selection. So the idea that animals had changed was not new, actually. This is something that had been recognized, but there was no mechanism for how animals had changed. And this is what Darwin really provided, this idea of natural selection, of survival of the fittest. Now, he proposed that if animals have changed, you should have these transitional fossils, these missing link taxa or fossils that will link different groups and show us these evolutionary transitions. And the fact that none, no such missing link fossils existed when he published Origin of Species was actually one of the biggest arguments against his hypothesis. People who were saying, we don't believe you, were saying, where are these missing links? Where are these transitional forms? And uh, in fact, there, there were none available at the time. Now, just two years after Darwin publishes uh, the origin of species, the first fossil Archaeopteryx is found. But the first specimen was just an isolated feather. But because at this time, in the 1800s, the only animals we knew that had feathers were birds. So you find this isolated feather and you're like, that's got to be a bird, right? Now, uh, very shortly after, just a couple, maybe one or two years later, the first skeletal specimen of Archaeopteryx was discovered, the London specimen. And here you have a almost complete specimen. It's missing the head and neck, and it's partially articulated, but you can see these big, the feathers forming very large wings, very similar to what we see in modern birds, but then this elongate reptilian tail. So Archaeopteryx really represented the perfect missing link taxon, the perfect transitional form. Although admittedly, Darwin did not regard it as this. He actually, when he mentions Archaeopteryx in his subsequent editions of origin of species, he's just like, look, that taxon, that discovery showed us how little we know about the fossil record. Interestingly enough, specimens of Archaeopteryx that do not preserve feathers were not recognized as being a bird. For example, this specimen here was actually thought to be a non-avian dinosaur uh, because it did not preserve wings. And it was only later that people realized this is also an Archaeopteryx. So Thomas Huxley, who was known as Darwin's bulldog uh, because he defended you know, the idea of uh, natural selection, he observed both Archaeopteryx and a small theropod dinosaur called Compsognathus, and he was the first to put forth this idea that birds are dinosaurs. Uh, he didn't really put it in that way, but we're going to give him credit for get, having this, uh, for being the first to have this idea. Now, in the 1920s, another scientist said, well, you know, you know, we have, uh, you know, we know the, the wishbone in birds, right? Something we've all played with during Thanksgiving, or at least most of us have. That's a bone that uh, we'll, the scientists call the furcula. Now this bone, which was, is preserved in Archaeopteryx, confirming its avian affinities, at this time had never been found in any dinosaur. So this, uh, another scientist in the 1920s says, well, you know, birds cannot have descended from dinosaurs because dinosaurs don't have a wishbone. So on the basis of this alone, 
this idea that birds descended from dinosaurs, that birds are dinosaurs, was rejected. So basically, for the next 100 years after Huxley first had this idea, people were kind of throwing out these different animals that they thought could possibly be the uh, the ancestor of birds. And actually, we'll want to say, because I think it's really interesting, in 1809, the first theory of where birds evolved from was put forth and it, uh, by a man named Lamarck. And he actually thought that birds evolved from turtles because they both have beaks. Now, the most popular hypo hypothesis in the early half of the 20th century was what was called the Thecodont hypothesis. Now, Thecodont is a term that scientists have since disregarded, or uh, we, we don't use it anymore. Uh, basically, we realize that it's not a natural group. So what it really refers to are primitive archosauromorph reptiles. So archosaurs uh, are a group of reptiles that include birds, that include pterosaurs, and a lot of other extinct lineages. So they thought, well, it must be some archosaur that birds evolved from. And they put forth this taxon called Euparcaria when it was discovered. Uh, and then actually in the 70s, it was put forth that birds actually uh, were more closely related to crocodiles. And crocodiles are also archosaurs. So the only two living lineages or extant lineages of, ar of archosaurs are the crocodiles and birds. Now, the reason that it was so difficult for people early on, you know, in the late 1800s and all through, you know, most of the uh, of the 1900s, why it was so difficult for them to understand where birds evolved from, because once I show you some fossils later, you're going to be like, well, it seems pretty obvious. But the fact is that at that time, we knew so little about extinct animals. There was so few fossils that had been collected. So you can see through time, we've learned more and more about the extinct faunas of extinct of all these different types of extinct reptiles. And this has essentially been allowed us to eventually understand or at least create a very strong hypothesis for where birds have evolved from. Now, bird, the, the birds are living dinosaurs hypothesis was resurrected in the 1970s by an American paleontologist named John Ostrom. And he wrote uh, you know, this really long monograph on a theropod dinosaur it's a member of a group called the Dromaeosauridae, uh, called Deinonychus. That's one that maybe a, a lot of people, especially dinosaur buffs, are familiar with. So he studied this, ta this taxon, and he used a, a new technique, or a technique that was gaining popularity, popularity at the time, called cladistics, which is what the technique that now current paleontologists use, and also other biologists, in order to infer relationships between animals. So basically, we are looking at morphology, and we're using computer algorithms to help us relate this morphology in order to understand animal relationships. So he studied Deinonychus, he studied Archaeopteryx, especially a newer specimen that had been found at this time called the Eichstatt specimen, and he used cladistics and he resurrected the idea that birds are living dinosaurs based on his observations. And also in 1983, a dinosaur percula was finally found. Uh, here's an example of one, it was found much later. I couldn't get an image of the one from 1983, but you get the point. Now, people still resisted John Ostrom's resurrection of this hypothesis. They still rejected the idea that birds were living dinosaurs until this, is, this discovery in the late 1990s of these feathered dinosaurs from the Jehol deposits in northeastern China. And so the first feathered dinosaur that was found preserves what we call dino fuzz, which is something that I will talk about a little more later. But soon after, just two years later, other feathered dinosaurs were found that not only preserved feathers, but they preserved modern type feathers. And these feathers were arranged on the forelimb, on the arm, forming a wing shape. So this showed us that not only did birds inherit feathers from dinosaurs, they also inherited wings from dinosaurs. So here you can see the most primitive dinosaur preserving a wing and the first a uh, non-avian dinosaur to preserve a wing that was ever found. It's a taxon called caudipteryx. Now, so we accept the idea that birds are living dinosaurs, but actually I want to say something really quickly about that. So uh, John Ostrom was interviewed after these feathered dinosaurs made this big splash. And they said, you know, these feathered dinosaurs in China have proven that you were correct about your hypothesis that birds are dinosaurs. And he was, you know, I guess kind of getting old and ornery at the time. And 
he said, pardon my French, I've been saying the same damn thing for years. Like all you had to do was look at Archaeopteryx. So in his mind, and actually this is something that paleontologists agree on, agree upon, if all the clues that you need to understand that birds are living dinosaurs are in this single important fossil Archaeopteryx, which is demonstrated by the fact that it was uh, Huxley's observations of Archaeopteryx that led him to his hypothesis, the original hypothesis that birds are dinosaurs. So the Dinosauria is an incredibly diverse group. There's over 700 species that have been found, and that's only supposed to be 20% of every dinosaur, all the dinosaur species that ever lived. Uh, dinosaurs form first two major groups. One is called Ornithischia, which means bird hip, but ironically does not include birds. And then the other group is called Saurischia, which means lizard hip, and does include birds nested within. Now within Saurischia, you have two major groups. You have your uh, sauropods, which are your giant long neck dinosaurs. And then you have your theropods, which are your bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs. And we know, or we hypothesize that birds are living theropod dinosaurs. And this is also what Thomas Huxley originally hypothesized because he was comparing Archaeopteryx to Compsognathus, which is uh, right about here. It's a you know bipedal theropod dinosaur. And this makes a lot of sense, right? If you want to evolve flight using your forelimbs, then your forelimbs need to be decoupled from your form of locomotion. So basically, if you're walking on all four legs, it's going to be a lot harder to then evolve your front legs, your arms to for a different form of locomotion flight. Now, uh, as we've discovered all these different amazing fossils coming out of China over the past 30 years, as well as a few exceptional fossils coming from other places, such as this little Ornithischian, this bird hip dinosaur um, here from Siberia, which you can see also preserves exceptional soft tissue and preserves the integument, which is the skin, the feathers, you know, hair in mammals, um, which uh, tell us, you know, which help us to put together the story of the evolution of feathers. And what we understand is that from the distribution of the feather morphologies that we see in all these different dinosaurs, we see that most dinosaurs have something that we call dino fuzz or a proto feather. So a feather just didn't evolve as a feather, this like a modern feather, which is a really complex structure. The first feathers were very simple. They were basically monofilaments, meaning they were something more akin to a hair, not a hair. Hairs have different evolutionary pathway. And if you look at the, mic uh, the microstructure of the follicle in a feather and a hair, you'll see that they're fundamentally very different. But the, my point is that the earliest feathers looked more like hairs and that they were just a single strand, right? Now we have all these different di uh, dinosaurs and also pterosaurs preserving these monofilament structures. And pterosaurs are called pycnofibers, but probably these simple monofilaments evolved in the common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs. But uh, we know from these deposits in China that tyrannosaurs had this dino fuzz um, on different parts of their body, maybe not covering the entire body, but definitely on certain parts. Uh, we now have all, we have direct evidence of this dino fuzz in lots of different dinosaurs, but the modern type feather, which we would see, we, which most of us have probably played with at some point. So this is a feather that has a central spine, which we call the rachis, and on either side has what we call pinaceous vein. And so this vein forms of barbs, with barbules coming off and these barbules have barbicets. So it's this like um, almost like a fractal like structure, but this is what allows the barbs that the neighboring barbs to interlock with each other, which allows the pinaceous vein to do that kind of zippery thing. You know, when we pulled apart the feather and then zipped it back together, this interlocking morphology is what we call a pinaceous feather. And pinaceous feathers are only found in three groups of non-avian dinosaurs. And because they're only found in these three groups, we know that birds must have evolved from one of these three groups. So these groups are the Oviraptorosauria, the and um, 
another group called the Deinonychosauria, which basically consists of two groups <laughs> together, which are the Troodontidae and the Dromaeosauridae. And I'm gonna talk about each of these three groups together, but one thing I do want to point out is that the Troodontids, Dromaeosaurids, and birds together make a more exclusive group called pair aves that excludes the Oviraptorosauria. So one way to interpret this is that we now think that it is more likely that birds are related to either troodontids or dromaeosaurids and less likely that they're related to oviraptorosaurs, even though oviraptorosaurs also have this advanced feather morphology. So let's take a look at these different groups that are candidates for um, avian ancestors. So let's start off with the oviraptorosauria, which again is the least likely candidate. So examples of oviraptorosaurs include Caudipteryx, which if you remember we showed you earlier is the most primitive dinosaur, non-avian dinosaur to preserve feathers in a wing-like arrangement on the forelimb, showing us that these wings evolved in dinosaurs and were inherited by birds. But there's other reasons why we know that this group of dinosaurs must be pretty closely related to birds. And for example, we have fossilized direct uh, evidence of behavior. For example, there are lots of uh, nesting oviraptorosaurs that have been discovered. And at first we weren't sure, are they um, preserved laying eggs? Are they preserved just protecting their eggs? Like what were they doing? It's definitely a more complex behavior than we see in more primitive dinosaurs. For example, most other dinosaurs just bury their eggs like a crocodile does. But here we see active parental care and you know a high degree of parental care is something that is unique to birds among all living reptiles so this is something that we would consider an avian characteristic and actually just in a paper that came out very recently it's been uh we have strong evidence that these dinosaurs were in fact brooding their eggs so they were providing body heat to their eggs the same way that living most living birds do the other group that is uh, another candidate for closest, closest relative to birds is the Dromaeosauridae. And the Dromaeosauridae includes Deinonychus, which was this taxon that John Ostrom studied, which helped him, uh, helped him to resurrect the idea that birds are living dinosaurs, as well as famous taxa like Velociraptor, and also specimens that preserve evidence that they had wings, like this taxon also from the Jeffel biota called Genuanlong. And you can see that these wings are actually pretty decent size, proportionately bigger than what we saw in Caudipteryx, but you can see that the forelimbs, the arms, are proportionately very short compared to the legs, so we know that this dinosaur was not flying, even though it had these big wing structures. Now the last group that is a potential candidate for closest avian ancestor is a group called the Troodontidae. And here we have a, a taxon called Anchiornis. We can see again, these feathers forming wings on the arms and also sort of on the legs. And here we have, again, evidence of fossilized behavior. Here's a little Troodontid and here's its arm and its neck is going. So it's tucked its, tucked its head behind its wing. So basically this is how modern birds sleep. And so this is again, directly fossilized uh, behavioral evidence of a strong link or close relationship between this group of dinosaurs and birds. Now let's talk about this little dromaeosaur dinosaur called Microraptor. Now this is the first specimen of a Microraptor that was ever found. Now we have like 200 specimens. But this was the first that was ever found. And you can see that it's not that nice, right? It's very incomplete. There's just like some kind of bad feather, not very nice feather uh, feather preservation kind of around the butt. And um, so because this, this specimen wasn't very nice, the only really exciting thing that you could say about Microraptor is that this is the smallest dromaeosaurid that had ever been found at that time. Now, a few, a few years later, a much nicer specimen of Microraptor is found. And this one is almost fully complete, fully articulated, but even more important, it preserves exceptional soft tissue preservation. So here we can see large feathered wings on both the arms and really large wings also on the legs. Now this got people really excited because this appears to be a four winged flying dinosaur. And it had actually been hypothesized 
you know, over a hundred years before, uh, that during the evolution of avian flight, birds had passed through a four wing gliding stage. So paleontologists basically thought that this is what we're seeing in Microraptor. So the point I really want to get across here is that paleontologists at the time recognized that Microraptor is a flying dinosaur, but they thought that it was part of one evolutionary origin of flight in dinosaurs, that basically Microraptor and birds had a common ancestor that evolved flight. So just one if, uh, one occurrence of flight evolving in, dinos in dinosaurs leading to multiple flying forms. Now, our tale kind of takes a, a left turn with the discovery of another Lagerstatten that is actually older than the Jehol Lagerstatten, but we didn't really realize it was there because these deposits look very similar and the fossils look very similar. And you can see that the gray deposits are the 131, 120 million year old deposits, this Jehol biota, and the yellow, uh, the rocks marked in yellow are the, this older 166, 160 million year old biota. So this biota, importantly, is older than the fossils, the, the rocks that have produced Archaeopteryx, the oldest fossil bird from the Jurassic of Germany. And you can see very nice soft tissue preservation again, exceptionally preserved fossils. Now this uh, Lagerstatten produced a new group of dinosaurs that we'd never heard of before, never seen anywhere, and it's called the Scansoriopterygidae. Don't blame me for that one, I didn't come up with the name. Now, the first uh, specimen that was published uh, is it's actually juvenile, uh, and it preserves this hand with this really elongate digit, which is something, a pattern, a, a, a hand morphology that has never been seen in any group of dinosaurs before. And then the next specimen that was found, you can see cuts off the arm, so that it didn't really give us any clue what was going on there. But uh, when this Epidendrosaurus was first published, the authors had to come up with some idea, well, what is that third finger, that elongate third finger for? What is the function? And so the original authors hypothesized that maybe it's a feeding adaptation. So that it, uh, and maybe something similar to what we see in the eye eye, which is a really weird type of lemur. And it uses its very powerful jaw muscles to chew into wood. And then it sticks its very, thin and elongate third digit into the hole and it pulls out things like insects, grubs, that kind of thing. So this is what the original authors hypothesized Epidendrosaurus was doing with its elongate third finger. Now fast forward more than 10 years to the discovery of another Scansoriopter rigid called that we eventually named Ichi. And this one is an adult, whereas Epidendrosaurus was a juvenile. Now what we see is a, we see again this very elongate third digit but what we also had preserved was this extra bone coming out of this out of the wrist very long bone and a bone that we've never seen in a dinosaur before so honestly when we were looking at this we were totally stumped uh, and this bone, which we ended up calling the styloform process, uh, we ended up understanding or coming up with a hypothesis what, for, with, for what this bone was for. Um, after one of my colleagues, uh, Corwin Sullivan, who's uh, one of my great friends, he's now up in Canada, or he returned home to Canada like I've returned home to the United States, but we overlapped the IVPP for a very long time. And he was doing research for a book he was writing and reading about flying squirrels. And he sees that flying squirrels have this bone that sticks out of the wrist that supports the flap of skin that they use for their, their form of flight. It's not powered flight like a bird, it's gliding flight, but it's still some kind of what we call volant activity. So uh, the lead author of the study goes ahead and looks at Ichi, this holotype again, and he finds that we even have soft tissue preservation of the skin membrane that's stretched in between this elongate finger and this elongate styliform process to create a membranous wing with which this dinosaur flew. And Ichi means strange wing. So what, these, what this fossil demonstrated was that Dinosaurs flew with many types of wings. Now, birds and Microraptor fly with wings that are formed out of feathers, but Ichi has this totally different type of wing morphology. It's a membranous wing, more like in a bat here, or a pterosaur, or a flying squirrel. It does not use feathers to fly. So 
this to me immediately suggested that flight has evolved more than one time in dinosaurs, but it was also possible that the common ancestor of Scansoriopterygids, birds and Microraptor, evolved flight, and that these all these dinosaurs inherited flight from this common ancestor. However, recent phylogenetic hypotheses, again, these um, these uh, this 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 uh, sorry this method called cladistics that John Ostrom used to support the idea that birds are living dinosaurs. Uh, recent cladistic analyses have supported the hypothesis that flight has evolved in in dinosaurs multiple times. So here, this is a this is a, a recent phylogenetic analysis published in 2020, and here I've marked all the taxa in this analysis that are birds. So here, this node here would be avis, and everything in it is birds, right? And then here we have Microraptor nested within uh, Dromaeosauridae. So, and we know that all the taxa closely related to it weren't flying. So we know that this is an independent origin of flight within this Microraptorine lineage of Dromaeosaurs. And also we have a taxon called Rahonavis, which is also a Dromaeosaur. I haven't talked about it yet. It's actually from the late Cretaceous of Madagascar. So, you know, even uh, like, 50, 60 million years after Microraptor evolves flight, um, 70 million years after Archaeopteryx, the first bird evolves flight, we still have flight evolving in, you know, in Madagascar and another group of dromaeosaurs. And actually this specimen uh, was originally described as a bird because they could see these avian characteristics of it. So they thought that's what they led the original researchers to think it was a bird, but actually what we think of as avian characteristics are really just aerodynamic characteristics. So all these dinosaurs that had these avian characteristics are actually just flying dinosaurs and the characteristics are aerodynamic characteristics that have evolved multiple times each like uh, separately, independently with each independent origin of flight. I hope that made sense. It came out a little bit jumbled. Now, you may have noticed that the Scansoriopterygidae is not included in this diagram. And that's because it appears that Scansoriopterygids are not a member of this group Paraavis, which remember is Deinonychosauria, which is the Troodontidae together with the Dromaeosauridae in a sister group relationship with birds. So let's talk about Scansoriopterygids. Where do they fit in? This is actually something that we have no idea. They are, are the most enigmatic, the most mysterious group of dinosaurs, in my opinion, that we currently know of. But they were only discovered 20 years ago, so who knows what other groups of dinosaurs there are out there to find. Remember, we supposedly only know of about 20% of all dinosaurs that have ever, all dinosaur taxa that ever lived. Now, one of the clues uh, that these this group of dinosaurs might not be very closely related to bird, Cansoriopterygids, uh, they do not preserve that pinaceous feather. Remember that modern feather, that morphotype that we were talking about that has that um, central spine, the rachis, and then has that zip-locking pinaceous vein formed of barbs with barbules and barbicets coming out the side. This type of feather appears to be absent in Scansoriopterygids. All we see are these dino fuzz, these monofilamentous feathers. Uh, we do have these really weird tail feathers that are preserved in one specimen, and they do look like badly preserved pinaceous feathers in some birds, but that doesn't really mean that's necessarily what they are. I mean, even when we have these beautiful soft tissue preservation, it's still kind of just a, a smear of the original tissue. It's not like we have a pristine tissue with all the different stratified levels that we can really look at and, and really understand what we have there. It's really, um, I mean, preservation does vary, but usually what we have is a very, just is a very limited trace of the original tissue. So these um, feathers, so most likely what we see is that this group may even be outside Peniraptora. They may be a group that is very primitive, that are um, not closely related to other flying dinosaurs um, because they don't have these pinaceous feathers. It's also possible, and some people believe this, that they have secondarily lost the pinaceous feather uh, since they, uh, in their evolutionary lineage, they, used, they evolved a flight apparatus that did not utilize feathers. So perhaps this um, very complicated type of feather, which is very energetic 
uh, energetically costly to, to grow on the body. Um, because they weren't using these feathers for flight, perhaps they evolved a secondary loss of this structure. Uh, because most phylogenetic analyses actually consider this group of dinosaurs to be related to oviraptorosaurs. So basically like a, a, a volant, you know, like oviraptor is this famous, you know, supposed egg thief. But as you saw in that slide, uh, it's associated with eggs actually because it's a very good parent, but that is a misnomer that will last forever. But um, we can think of them as very small flying oviraptorosaurs, which I think is, is pretty exciting and pretty fun to imagine. So looking at these four different uh, independent origins of flight in the dinosauria that we know of, and mind you, this is something we've only come to understand within the past like five years. It's, uh, and only maybe within the last year or two has it been something that is widely accepted. So I would uh, hypothesize that there are probably other groups of flying dinosaurs that have not yet been identified or possibly have not yet been found. So anyways, let's take a look at these four lineages that we do know of right now. So we have the Scansoriopterygids, and they fly with a membranous wing, with skin that is stretched out between this elongate digit and this um, styloform process. And I just want to reiterate how, how fun it is that when the first specimen was found with no soft tissue, we thought that this elongate finger is a feeding adaptation. But with the discovery of specimens preserving soft tissue, we realized that this dinosaur is actually using its elongate wing finger to fly. So we have membranous wings in the Scansoriopterygidae. Birds, of course, we know fly with feathered wings only on the forelimbs. We know that Microraptor, a dromaeosaurid dinosaur, flies with wings formed out of feathers on its forelimbs, its arms, and also on its hind limbs or its legs. And then we have Rahonavis, another dromaeosaurid dinosaur, but this dinosaur does not preserve soft tissues. So we actually have no idea what its flight apparatus would have been like. I mean, we can make, of course, an educated guess, and that would be that it, it definitely uh, uses feathers to create the aerodynamic surface. Um, and we know this also because one of the bone on the arm where some of the, the secondary flight feathers attach, uh, we have little bumps on the bone uh, called quill knobs, which are where these feathers were attaching. It's a widespread feature in living birds, but uh, at the time had not been found in a non-avian dinosaur, which is another reason why these original authors thought that Rahonavis was actually a bird. But without the preservation of soft tissue, we cannot say exactly how this dinosaur was flying. We can only make an educated guess. And I'd like to say one more thing about Rahonavis that I think is pretty neat is that a lot of the specimens, not the holotype, but a lot of the referred material are here at the Field Museum. Now you may be asking, well, okay, so birds, uh, you know, these flying dinosaurs evolved from not dinosaurs that did not fly, but that had already had these wing-like structures formed of feathers on their forelimbs. Like, well, how do you get from something that has a wing but not flying to something that has a wing and does fly? Now, there has been a lot of research done on how flight evolved in dinosaurs, but because up until really recently, we thought that birds and maybe birds plus Microraptor were the only flying dinosaurs, there hasn't been a lot of research done on how did Scansoriopterygids evolve flight or how did Rahonavis flight. So almost all the research we've done has been focused on well, how did the bird lineage evolve flight. Now, one thing that I think is pretty interesting is that the idea the, or the theory behind this is an old idea, an idea that dates back again to Darwin, which really just highlights how much of a genius he really was. So the idea that a structure first evolves for another, for, a, for one purpose, and then evolution kind of hijacks the structure and then uses it for something else. Like for example, wings, we know that these little proto wings, I call them, wings that are not used for flight, that these proto wings in dinosaurs evolve first for some other purpose, and then eventually were used for flight. So that is an example of exaptation. Now, exaptation is a more recent term, but Darwin came up with the same idea, but he called it pre-adaptation. However, later, later 
paleontologists said, well, pre-adaptation implies a directedness that you know you're going, like you basically know the second stage, so you're pre-adapted for it. And, uh, and so paleontologists didn't like that idea, so they changed it from Darwin's pre-adaptation to exaptation. So feathers themselves and also wings are examples of exaptation. So the hypothesis is that you have these uh, small wings on the forelimbs that evolved for some purpose, which we really don't know what it was. I would put forth the hypothesis that it evolved under sexual selection, which is also an idea that was first put forth by Charles Darwin. So that these are some kind of display structure. And uh, the reason I would argue that this is because if you look at the huge diversity of living birds today, we see such bizarre and beautiful structures that are clearly used for some kind of intraspecific signaling, meaning they're for attracting mates or competing between males. So that's what we mean by intraspecific within a species signaling, some kind of communication within the species. And this type of sexual selection has produced these extravagant structures. And so I think an example of um, similar sexual selection producing extravagant structures in dinosaurs produced things like the first proto wings. So I would argue that this is some kind of ornamentation. And maybe this suggests that this specimen is a male, uh, but uh, and that these feather structures were sexually dimorphic, but that's something that we that we really don't know. And honestly, testing the sexual uh, selection hypothesis is basically impossible to do. So we're always just going to be guessing about that. And if you wanted to know where, where did feathers evolve, why did feathers evolve first to begin with, the leading hypothesis is for thermoregulation, uh, basically the same as hair in mammals in order to conserve body heat. But again, that's something that's going to be very difficult for paleontologists to test. Now, the idea is that you have these dinosaurs with these proto wings. You know, you can see again, the forelimbs very short, hind limbs very long. So definitely not a flying dinosaur uh, or at least be hypothesized. And it has these feathered surfaces on its um, forelimb. But we can tell from these legs that this is a cursorial animal, meaning an animal that's running around on the ground, kind of like say an ostrich. So um, the hypothesis is that if these, that these wings would not have been originally for an aerodynamic purpose, but they had a secondary aerodynamic purpose anyways. They're for display, but still when you're running around, they were giving the this dinosaur, Caudipteryx, some kind of aerodynamic advantage. So even though these wings are not big enough to form enough lift to counterbalance, counteract the body mass that's you know bringing the animal down and allowing the animal to fly they're still creating what we call residual lift which would basically mean that it's um, counteracting just a little bit of the animal's body mass which allows it to run faster and also maybe jump higher and that this would have caused natural selection to act on this feature, this proto wing, and to um, select for larger and larger proto wings until eventually the size of the wing was large enough to allow to create enough lift to cancel out that normal force and allow the animal to become airborne. So this is just a hypothesis. And I was approached by some engineers in Tsinghua University, which is China's premier science and engineering uh, university in Beijing. And they wanted to test this hypothesis uh, of how, you know, wings may have produced, you know, some minimal aerodynamic benefit. So they, we did a lot of crazy things together, which was kind of fun. Uh, you know, it's it, it was very different from the research that I normally did. So one of the things they, they did was they built a robot Caudipteryx. And I'll be honest, all I really did to help was give them the anatomical specifications of what this animal would have looked like and how big the, big the, aerosurf, uh, the aerodynamic surface of the wing would have been. But my favorite experiment they did was they um, built like robot wings that are, are a proxy for the wings in Caudipteryx and they strapped them to baby ostriches, which are roughly at a, an age when they're about the size of Caudipteryx. And then they chased these little ostriches around and measured the aerodynamic forces that were being generated by these wings that are a proxy for the wings of Caudipteryx. Because of course they're robots 
Cauditorix was much more awkward. It wasn't able to run as fluidly as this little baby ostrich. And this, the way this ostrich is running is probably a better proxy for how uh, Cauditorix would have moved. Now, what this experiment, I mean, silly as it seems, but this experiment has, you know, genuine scientific value. It proved a number of things, one being Cauditorix definitely wasn't flying, which was obvious, but it was nice to prove it. And then also the aerodynamic forces that were picked up by these little robot wings confirm the hypothesis that a wing that cannot be used for flight still has incipient aerodynamic uh, qualities that could then allow natural selection to act upon and uh, select for a larger wing. Oops. No. Okay. Now the uh, Takeaway messages that I that I would like to basically repeat <laughs> to make sure that these these couple of points hit home is that fossilized soft tissues are yes they're very rare in this in the fossil record but they are so important to our understanding of extinct animals which kind of then begs the question how how wrong are we about all these other animal groups that don't have soft tissues preserved like our hypotheses are so uh, you know we imagine that a scansoriaptor rigid is using its finger for feeding you have soft tissue it's actually flying you know that's how different that's how wrong we can be and i think it's also really important to to you know be honest about how scientists are wrong and, and science is essentially a series of mistakes that are bringing us ever closer to um the truth and then soft tissues of course have been very important to the understanding of not only the evolution of dinosaur in flight but also the evolution of birds if archaeopteryx had not preserved soft tissues we probably would not have recognized it as the oldest fossil bird that we know of. Dinosaur in flight has evolved at least four times, but stay tuned. I'm sure there's going to be some new ones popping up in the next 10, 20 years. And I also just really want to highlight the power of new discoveries to drastically change everything that we think we know. And really, to me, this is most demonstrated by the discovery of I Chi. Uh, you know, we thought that flight had evolved only once, and we find this one fossil, and we suddenly realize Scansoriopter rigids are bat winged dinosaurs, and flight has evolved at least four times. Times in, in the Dinosauria, which was at least to me ex very, very exciting. And um, with that, I would like to thank you so much for listening and for joining me this evening. And uh, I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. That was so interesting. Um, I can't wait to drop the word Lagerstaden in, in conversation sometime. <laughs> um, uh, we just we have um, uh, just a couple questions. Um, uh, in in the chat right now, um, and one one is from Joel, who's who asks, what was the primary reason that allowed fossils to be created? Was it volcanic? Was it sinking into river muck, or or combination of those? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, you can so there's three types of rocks, right? There's sedimentary rock, igneous rock, and metamorphic rock, and uh, these types of rock form in different ways, like igneous rock mostly forms from like volcanism type related things. You're not gonna have any fossils in igneous rocks, right? You're only gonna have fossils in sedimentary rocks, which are rocks that form from bits of other rock basically, and then can trap organisms within it. And depending on what we call the depositional environment. So this is the environment in which the little pieces of other rock, whether it's sand, or mud, which makes sandstone and mudstone respectively, right? Um, depending on this depositional environment, we're gonna have different, uh, different likelihoods of having fossils and also different likelihoods of having exceptionally well-preserved fossils. So all the fossils from the Jehol and the uh, biota and also the older Yangnao biota represent what we call volcano lacustrine deposits. So that's just a fancy word for saying that they're ancient lakes that also were punctuated by volcanic activity. And so the volcanic activity was probably responsible for the fact that we have mass, mass mortality events. So you have a slab, which is like tons of dead animals on it. And that was probably because they were all killed by some volcanism. But it's actually the lake deposits that are the reason we have such wonderful preservation. So lakes are like, the best place to find really, really well-preserved fossils. The Green River Formation is also an ancient lake. Um, and this is because lakes are basically uh, 
you have rivers feeding lakes, right? The water has to come from somewhere and rivers have energy and they're like flowing and they're carrying sediment. And as soon as they reach the lake, which is basically static, they deposit the sediment that they're carrying. So any animal that is falls into a lake and dies and sinks to the bottom is guaranteed to be covered by the sediment that's trickling in from the rivers. If you die on a forest floor, you're not going to get fossilized. You're going to get scavenged by all these other animals. And, you know, there's no deposition forming, you know, there's not like a lot of rock accumulating on the forest floor, right? So, um, so it's these lake deposits that really provide this perfect, these really wonderful glimpses into ancient ecosystems. So you're probably asking or thinking, well, why don't you just go find ancient lakes and just, you know, quarry all the amazing fossils that are in them? I wish we could. The fact is lakes a cover a very, very small portion of the Earth's surface. And they're also ephemeral features. So even a big lake is only gonna be around for like maybe 10 million years max, 20 million years. I mean, I don't, I'm, like, I'm not sure about that exactly. Um, I don't know how long, for example, Lake Baikal has been there, but Lake Baikal also used to be part of the ocean. Anyways, but um, the, the lakes in you know this part of Northeastern China were intermittently present for, yeah, like, you know, 10 million years and then a gap and then another 10 million years. Uh, but um, yeah, so they're just basically, what I'm trying to say, sorry, is that lake deposits are very rare and very difficult to find. So uh, so that's why when we do find them, we just get such wonderful treasures from them. Great, well, that, that leads straight into um, a question um, from uh, Peterson, um, who says, um, what's so unique about that region in China that fossils are preserved so well. So it's, it was like Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, and there were just a lot of lakes. Right? Yeah, it's, it's that, that's the main reason for sure. The second reason is the unique socioeconomic circumstances in China. So, uh, you know, the first fossil that feathered dinosaur was found by a farmer. And then you know, all these farmers in this region, because this area is not like, you know, vast desert, like you would imagine where paleontologists are looking. It's very fertile land. So these rocks, uh, these fossils come from quarries that are dug down below the, the green, right? And um, so yes, paleontologists have done a lot of digging, but there's a lot more farmers than there are paleontologists. And farmers can make a lot more money selling fossils than they can farming. So because of all these farmers who have been collecting fossils, we have thousands and thousands of specimens. Like there's a bird called Confucius Ornus, literally thousands of specimens. One museum alone has 600 specimens. It's crazy. And, uh, you know, Microraptor, hundreds of specimens, like all these different tags. I won't keep naming numbers and taxa, but just really incredible wealth of fossils. And, um, you know, some things are more rare, like that little dinosaur with the um, head tucked under its wing. That's also from those deposits. It's three-dimensionally preserved and not in a slab, you might have noticed, because that was from an interbedded volcanic event. So it was sleeping and then a volcano went off and, boom, and uh, buried him. And that's what happened. So it's very sad, but also very cute. And um, yeah, and also the feathered tyrannosaurs come from here. Big things like that are much more rare, but we do have tons of birds and, and fish by the millions. It sounds like, I, when, when you were talking about that, I was thinking, but the, all these farmers who are out scouting for you, basically, um, they, they are taking everything out of context and which could be kind of a downside to it, but maybe on the whole, it's a good thing because you're just getting so much material. That's like a very, you nailed it right on the head. Like, uh, I mean, the fact is it's a double-edged sword, right? Um, which like most things, you know, there's a good side and there's a bad side. So we have tons of specimens, but we don't know exactly where they came from. And we don't know their precise ages. We're like, it's somewhere in this 100, this 10 million year gap or like a section, right? They're either, they're between 130 and 120 million years old. And they will usually tell us, oh, it's from this locality, but then you know, is it really? Yeah, you know, so, uh, and I've definitely noticed some things that are like inconsistencies. Also, another thing that farmers sometimes like to do is they will tinker with the specimen a little bit to make it look nicer. So it has a higher value. So that's another thing you need to keep your eyes out for. Now, I mean, people always kind of like, will be like, oh, you know, why did the Chinese do this? And it's actually, that's a very old practice that dates back to the, to the 19th century, where museums in Europe would commonly in, enhance their specimens for display. So um, it's not it's not a new it's not a new practice, but it is of course um, not good for science. But these are but you know you still have this 
incredible wealth of specimens. You have a few that are tinkered with, but you look out for it. You make sure to ignore the parts that have been possibly, you know, um, enhanced. And uh, and right now we're actually looking for ways to reclaim the lost age and locality data. Can you describe some of the uh, enhancements that you've seen? Oh, uh, well, so yeah, like, um, painted on feathers, you know, like, uh, yeah, they'll paint feathers and it looks cooler, right? It's much nicer display specimen. Also, there was one bird, uh, it had like the furcula, the wishbone was very obvious, right? And this was in a museum in a town called Dalian in North, and that's in Liaoning province where the Jehol biota is. So we brought a preparator from America to work on these specimens because unfortunately there's not a lot of skilled preparators in China. It's a, it's a very rare occupants, occupation. So we bring this preparator to, work on the specimen. The specimen, yes, the feathers were fake. They had been painted on. And then also as she was digging, she found a second furcula. So basically they had taken a furcula from something else and stuck it on there to make it look more complete, not knowing that there already was a furcula in the slab buried under sediment. So, uh, but yeah, and then I get an argument sometimes with my colleagues. I'm like, those feathers are fake. And they're like, no, I think they're real. And I'm like, you know, try the, does, you know, the water test, does, do they dissolve, right? And, uh, and the, the feathers didn't dissolve. And I'm like, they're like, see, you know, your own test, do they prove that these must be real feathers? I'm like, no, I think they've just wised up and now they're using non-water soluble paints. Like it doesn't, but we, there's still ways to test that because uh, one thing you guys may have heard of that's really exciting is we can now tell at least partially what color dinosaurs were, feathered dinosaurs, and also dinosaurs that preserve their skin based on pigment containing mono organelles. So basically these little things called melanosomes that are in feathers that are responsible for color. And these things fossilize. Basically when you look at a fossilized feather, that's all it is. Like the matrix of the feather is gone and all you have are the pigment containing organelles which are very decay resistant. So we can basically scrape a little piece of the, the feather that we're like, is a feather, is it not a feather? And we can look at it under a scanning electron microscope and then we could very clearly see whether or not it was real or not. Wow. Uh, um, I, I just wanted to mention uh, someone named Liz said, this was so fantastic. I could listen to Dr. O'Connor talk all night. Thank you. And I agree with that. Um, I'm going to wrap up with um, a question from, let's see, do we have any Q&A now? Um, a question from Dan Goodwin, who says, so is the goldfinch outside my window really a tiny T-Rex? Yes, yes. It, well, it's not a tiny T-Rex, but it is a tiny dinosaur. And T-Rex, in the grand scheme of the dinosauria, T-Rex is pretty closely related to birds. In fact, they form a group, like the common ancestor of birds, and, and T-Rex is a group called Tyranoraptora. Uh, but yeah, I like to think that it's funny, you know, like dinosaur nuggets, like why don't they make a bigger deal that, I mean, yeah, they're shaped like dinosaurs, but why don't people make a big deal that they are made of dinosaurs, you know? Like, I think that's really exciting. And actually since, you know, really wrapping, like, you know, when I grew up, I thought that there's class reptilia, class mammalia, you know, class avies, they're different, right? But now we actually know birds are reptiles and birds are dinosaurs. And since really understanding that, I actually find birds a lot more terrifying. And it's also really, uh, you know, crazy to imagine dinosaurs uh, using birds as an as an analog for the way they move for their their sensory abilities because in fact T Rex could see better than an eagle uh, it had a, a very strong sense of smell uh, you know it uh, it had a very it had a very large brain bigger than any other dinosaur except for birds and their closest relatives so um, yeah I mean, T Rex was really this this incredibly formidable, um, you know, apex predator, like not just big and, and, you know, exciting in its appearance, but it, biologically, it was a really impressive animal. So um, yeah, you know, we've all seen dinosaurs, we've all eaten dinosaurs. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, finally, um, um, is the Field Museum open? It is, and as of this Friday, it will be open every day. So I was in, I, ha, I, go, I only go to go in for work one day a week, and Wednesday is my day. Uh, so it had previously been closed Tuesday, Wednesday. And I have to admit, I'm gonna miss being able to wander around the exhibits with no one there and it's dark and it's kind of exciting. Um, but yes, please do come support the museum. Uh, we, uh, we, we appreciate the support. Museums are struggling these days, not to like be like a beggar or anything, but uh, you know, it's, it's, there's wonderful things to see. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I hope you can come on down. 
And and when we do come on down, um, will we be able to see some soft tissue examples? Are there some on display? Yes, yeah. So the um, those ones I showed in the beginning, uh, the the hadrosaur tail uh, that was on display. I pulled it out of display so I could like study it a little bit. But uh, hopefully it's gone back. And then also, if you look at our um, Green River Lagerstätte uh, room, that's like dedicated entirely to to that to that Lagerstätte which is singular for Lagerstatten, uh, you will also see lots of um, preserved feathers and also some things like plants, which are also soft tissue. And of course, the beloved Tully monster, which is soft tissue preservation. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure we all really enjoyed this very much and the comments that are coming from people indicate the same thing. So um, thank you, Dr. O'Connor. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We'll say good night. Thank you so much for having me. Everyone have a wonderful night. Bye-bye.